Hi, everyone. We're excited to talk today with Dr. Ellie Murray. She's an assistant professor of epidemiology at the Boston University School of Public Health. I'm Amanda McCulloch. I also am actually a BUSPH alumna. I did my master's in public health back in 2009 and 2010 at BU. Uh, and I currently am supporting and working with the Tableau team on the COVID Data Resource Hub, providing some public health and data viz insights. Um, I'm excited to talk to Ellie today to bring us some new information and insights and some clarity around the complexity of the COVID-19 case data. So Ellie, excited to have you here. Excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Sure. Can you share a bit more about your work and your research, Ellie? Yeah, so my research is actually about methods for epidemiology. So I spend a lot of my time thinking how we can do the best job possible to analyze data, how we can uh, make sure that our analyses match up with what information we want to know and what um, questions we should be asking to really inform our decisions. So a lot of that is about causal inference, um, some of it for randomized trials, some of it for observational data, and also a lot of it for mathematical models, like similar to the types that are being used a lot for COVID modeling. Interesting. So it seems like every newspaper or media outlet has some kind of chart that's tracking changes in the case counts for COVID-19. And we've seen some data scientists have been dabbling in creating their own models. So we'd really love to talk to you today about the case data through your lens as an epidemiologist with all of this relevant expertise you have, especially with methods. Um, so I, I think it's helpful to kind of backtrack a little bit. I've seen more mentions of epidemiology in the media in the past month, I think since the past 10 years that I finished my MPH, if I was to, get, to guess. Uh, for someone who hasn't heard of the field of epidemiology before, can you actually define and talk a little bit about what it is that epidemiologists do? Yeah, so the sort of technical definition of epidemiology is that we study the determinants and distribution of disease and how to intervene to change those. Um, but basically, big picture is sort of thinking about the population level. Why do groups of people or populations get sick? How can we keep them healthy? What kinds of things do we need to do to prevent illness or um, to change our structures so that uh, people aren't getting sick in the first place? And once people are sick, how can we help make them better? So um, compared to something like medicine, which focuses one at a time on individual patients, epidemiology is really focused on whole groups of people and how those groups interact with each other and interact with systems around them. It sounds like a lot of what we try to do in public health more broadly. I know you guys just have the specialized knowledge to actually build the models and do the math, right? You help the yeah. rest of us actually do our jobs better. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, epidemiology is certainly not, um, can't really operate without the rest of public health. Um, we're sort of the, the sort of more technical methods aspect of it. A lot of, you know, when it comes to implementing or collecting data or interfacing with the community, that's where we need the experts in public health who have those kind of skills for outreach, for implementation for translation, for sure. That's great. So let's talk about the confirmed cases. Those are the counts we see, keep seeing in all these daily trackers, right? So what are the different kinds of COVID-19 cases that we see discussed in the news and on, on all these different charts? Yeah, so I think that it's really important to distinguish these types of cases because um, the data that's being reported typically is confirmed cases. And then some places, so a confirmed case, let me say, is someone who has a positive COVID-19 test. So they've been able to access a test. That test has been sent to the laboratory and processed, and the result has come back, and it is positive for SARS-CoV-2. And so there's, as you can imagine, a lot of steps in that process where things could intervene to stop that from getting reported. Um, but this is a good indication that if you have a confirmed a positive COVID test, it's a good indication that you do in fact have COVID. So the confirmed cases are the ones that we're really confident about. We, we know that they exist. Um, we also see in the media a lot of times reported um, hospitalization numbers for COVID. Mm -hmm. And this is typically a subset of confirmed cases which have been admitted to hospital for their COVID symptoms. And that um, gives us kind of a picture more about severe cases. Some hospital systems, because testing is so difficult, may not um, report only confirmed hospitalized cases, but probable or suspected hospitalized cases. So let me just briefly define those. Um, 
<laughs> a suspected case is someone who has all the symptoms, um, has some reason to believe they have COVID, but hasn't necessarily had access to a test yet. A probable case is one who has had access to the test and it maybe is a little bit equivocal. So they have all the symptoms, there's good reason to believe they have COVID, but maybe the test wasn't quite clear. Um, we also know that uh, a single negative test doesn't necessarily rule out COVID. Um, usually if we want to be sure that someone doesn't have COVID, we want two negative tests. So someone who's only had one negative test but has all the symptoms of COVID, we might list them as a probable case. So, that sounds complicated. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And then the last sort of type of case you might see reported is deaths from COVID. And um, those are ones where we have typically confirmed, but possibly also probable or suspected COVID cases um, that have been so severe the person's died, the death is attributed to COVID, and the death is recorded. So this is typically in-hospital COVID death. Um, one thing we've been seeing from a lot of countries like Italy and China is that as they've gotten their outbreaks under control, their death counts are going way up because now they're starting to look at deaths that occurred at home and trying to track that information. Oh, wow. So is there uh, a consistent definition that's used across all countries or are there challenges in comparing countries too? <laughs> yeah, there is not. So um, <laughs> the, the definition of what makes something a confirmed case, I think is, is pretty reasonable. Although it's important to remember that most countries are using their own tests and every test has its own um, performance. So we call sensitivity and specificity, the features of the test that tell us if somebody tests pos positive or somebody has the disease, what's the chance they'll test positive? If somebody doesn't have the disease, what's the chance they'll test negative? And those will vary from test to test. Um, and so they'll vary from country to country. <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot of sources of potential messiness in this data. Well, I think, and you're pointing to the fact that it's not just about like the number of people tested. There's a lot of other nuances to how those tests perform and the double negative test piece on like one negative, but totally symptomatic doesn't necessarily mean they don't have COVID. So lots of complexity there. I'd be curious, just given all of those nuances and that complexity, uh, what are some of the common mistakes you've seen as you've been reading the news and seeing different presentations and analysis of the case data? Yeah, so I think the number one biggest mistake is people reporting the numbers as cases. So saying, you know, today we had this many cases. You know, yesterday it was reported that there was a thousand COVID deaths in the U.S. for the first time. And that is a thousand deaths we know about. It's mm. not necessarily the same thing as a thousand deaths. The real number is potentially higher. Certainly um, with deaths, hopefully, you know, as until the health system is quite overwhelmed, hopefully the real number isn't that much larger, but with actual cases, the real number is potentially a lot larger because people have a lot of problems accessing tests. Um, another thing to think about in terms of, you know, the, the data is that, you know, if I get a test taken today, it's going to take several days for that test mm -hmm. to get run. And depending on how many tests are being done in my area will affect when that gets reported. So treating case counts, even reported case counts as cases that occurred today instead of cases that um, actually may have been tested several days ago. And then the last thing is that we know that it takes a, at least a couple of days and possibly up to 14 days for people to show symptoms before they've, mm -hmm. you know, after they've been infected. And so thinking about the case counts as what's happening today with transmission instead of what's happening two weeks ago is another common error that I see. Oh, interesting. And that kind of speaks to that kind of how we look at things on a calendar and kind of assume that things happen on those days. I know one of the nuances I saw people talking about, and you can confirm or deny if this is right, is that we sometimes see that kind of flattening out happening on a Sunday and that it's more related to reporting, I heard, than actually related to an actual flattening. Is that right? Um, so I haven't actually seen that, but it's, it's completely believable. I would, I would definitely expect that to be true. Um, you know, the people who are working in these labs doing these testings are working around the clock, but everybody needs a little bit of a break now and then. So <laughs> it's possible that reporting is down on Sundays for sure. Um, another thing that kind of is related to that is that we see, um, you know, if you look at the distribution of reported cases versus reported hospitalizations versus reported deaths, you can see that, you know, it takes... Um, about two, up to two weeks for symptoms to be developed so someone could be tested, but it takes potentially longer for them to get to the point of needing hospitalization and even mm -hmm. longer to the point of needing death. So you'll see different timings of when flattening out or peaks happen in those different, um, those different variables and different ways of defining, you know, what is a case that you're interested in. 
Well, and I think that you point to this lagging piece around deaths compared to cases. And I saw some of that when we were first talking about what's the case fatality rate, because that's a, a big question people started asking is like, it's a way that we could try to benchmark this against other diseases. But as I understand from my public health background, that's pretty complicated. Uh, you know way more about that in depth from an epidemiology perspective. But is this an example of where just because we can do the math, maybe we shouldn't? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Case fatality rate is really, really complicated thing. It sounds really simple. It sounds like, well, you just take the number of deaths and you divide it by the number of cases. But an, an evolving new outbreak situation, a new pandemic, a new zoonosis, um, we don't know what either of those numbers are is and we don't know how badly we don't know those numbers so you know the very first case that's detected if that case dies we have a hundred percent case fatality um, until we find another case and then it immediately would drop to 50 percent right so the smaller the numbers we have the more it's going to change like by quite large amounts but the mm -hmm. other thing is usually in an outbreak the cases that come to attention earliest are the ones that are sickest so they're the ones that are most likely to die so even as we get a better estimate of the numerator, we're really doing poorly on the denominator, um, even now in a lot of places. And then the last tricky thing is that there are many different ways of defining what we mean by case when we talk about a case fatality mm -hmm. rate. Um, we could be talking about symptomatic cases, we could be talking about hospitalized cases, or we could be talking about what's sometimes referred to as the infection fatality ratio, mm -hmm. which is how many people die out of those who are infected. And, Right now, we don't know whether there are people who are, get infected but never show symptoms. But if there are, that could mean that the infection fatality ratio is, is much lower than the case fatality ratio we've been seeing. I feel like there's like an Epi 101 primer that everyone needs to read through to understand all these words and these calculations with some asterisks on like what to look for, what not to look for. Uh, I'm curious when you're digging into new charts and graphs and you see new things pop up in the media or from even from colleagues, what is it that you look for in a chart, a graph, even a model uh, to assess if it's actually legitimate and if it gives valuable, insightful, usable information? Yeah, so I think that the, um, you know, most legitimate models and graphs are going to tell you where did the data come from? What is the data they're using and what does that data mean? So they're going to be explicit. This is reported cases from these states or this is hospitalizations and what is the time frame? If that information isn't there, just don't look at it because it's not going to be, you're not, you don't have any way of vetting it. <laughs> um, the second thing is how did they come up with the information to visualize or the model? Are they, um, you know, they might have a scatter plot and then, you know, or they may have a line. If they have a line, how did they come up with that? Is that from a regression model? Did they just fit an exponential? Did they do some kind of compartmental SIR model to, to estimate that? Um, so do they tell you what they did? So that's the first step. If they didn't tell you what they did, again, you have no way of evaluating it. And mm -hmm. then once you've sort of, yes, they have their data. Yes, they've said what they did. Now the next question is, you know, do they seem aware of the limitations of what they've done? And are they conveying to you sort of what things need to be true to believe the information they're showing you? Mm. Um, because, for example, right now, cases are, in the U.S. at least, growing exponentially. But they're not going to grow exponentially forever. At the very minimum, they have to stop once everyone is infected, right? So at some point, um, an exponential curve is, is a really bad way to model this. But we need to think about, you know, sometimes even modeling it for a week gives you kind of weird and unusual examples. Mm -hmm. And especially because when we can't trust our data, where we start an exponential curve at has a really big impact on where it gets to. And if, we, if you're modeling an exponential curve, you get exponentially wrong if you're exponentially wrong. wrong. <laughs> I, I, feel, I feel like that's something that we need like a, a little like tag for people on exponential curves gone wrong, exponentially wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, one of the things I've seen too is that when we're digging into some of these more specific numbers within individual subpopulations or different groups, you see some of the reports from the CDC and they have a huge number of total cases, but then the number of cases with the data we need to do additional analysis is really small relative to those total cases. But then I see it spun up in news media and other charts and graphs like it's some kind of certainty. How do you kind of dig in and assess when something's worth looking at and, and could be more generalizable in terms of new knowledge? I think the important thing here is that um, models uh, or mathematical models, especially, um, but even the models that are drawn a graph with a line 
are only as good as um, the assumptions we put into them. And so basically, you know, the way to think about these models is that they are just another way of visualizing what our current state of knowledge tells us could happen or could be happening. And they're not mm. actually giving us, um, you know, insight, crystal ball insight into the future. And they can't tell us anything that we haven't already kind of learned. <laughs> and so it's sort of putting together our assumptions to come up with some different guess. And so, you know, a good modeling team will provide not just one model, but a whole range of models under different um, circumstances or different interventions or different uh, sets of assumptions with sensitivity analyses to see how those different models perform. Hmm. And that's interesting because I, I think it calls attention to the fact that even experts who know this space well go ahead and test and try so many different ways of making sense of that information and modeling out what could happen. And it's not that crystal ball, right? So, I mean, given how complex this is and given that it has so many nuances and challenges, there are a ton of people in the broader data community and the tech community who are saying, you know, I really want to pitch in and help. This is, this is a global crisis. This is a situation I want to help in. How do I put my skills to good use? So what advice do you have for people who are data visualization folks or data scientists who want to find ways to meaningfully contribute? Yeah, so I think that there are a lot of ways for people to meaningfully contribute, but I think the important thing is to recognize what your specific area of expertise is. So, you know, as I said, epidemiologists are focused on health and illness, and um, but we also have a lot of economics problems that are coming out with the response to this pandemic. We have supply chain issues, and epidemiologists don't have the background for that. So if you're someone who's working in, you know, data science analytics in a business setting and understand how to model supply chains, reach out to an epidemiology modeling team and ask if there's a way that you can help contribute add, adding information about supply chains onto their model of the, the epidemic. How, um, you know, how you can bring the knowledge of the pieces that you have about what you've been doing data science on before to inform and improve their models rather than starting from scratch trying to model the disease part which is something that you don't have the expertise to do that's a great that's great advice and i think those collaboration pieces are i think where we have some of the most powerful information graphics coming from too right when we look to the the stories behind graphics even like the flatten the curve animation the story behind that isn't that someone sat in a room and coded in this model together it's that someone went ahead and collaborated with an epidemiologist and with subject matter experts and said how do we take this complex concept and make it more accessible through visualization and information so i, I love the call out for finding ways to collaborate and I know, do you have any suggestions on where people go to find an epidemiologist? So, I mean, I think um, Twitter is really a place where a lot of epidemiologists are talking and sharing and asking for help on different topics. And I think that's actually a really great place to, to find them. Another thing um, you can do is reach out to the, your local hospital or your local health department or a local mm. school of public health if you have one and offer your services. Tell them explicitly what you can do so they can see if that's something that is needed. Um, and then for people whose who's, um, expertise really is in the sort of graphic or visual display of information, another way to help actually is sort of related to the flattening the curve. Flattening the curve is not a new idea. That's something that's been part of the infectious disease outbreak concept for a long time. And so spending some time to, you know, read up on um, epidemiology concepts and then trying to figure out ways to communicate those and visualize them can be really helpful at this point. So instead of looking at, you know, the really new information that's coming out today, go back and look at the old information and see, is there a way you can help the general public kind of understand these concepts? That can be really useful. Um, and then you know, it may be easier to find an epidemiologist who's not necessarily right in on the COVID response, but has a bandwidth to help vet and proofread and, and go back and forth with you on that kind of thing. And those, I think, will be really useful collaborations. That's great. Well, Ellie, this has been just delightful. I always love connecting back with folks at BU, and it's great to have you share your expertise. I know I, I work in public health and I'm a data viz person and have a lot of deep knowledge in the public health space, but always have so much respect and appreciation for the really complex math that all of you are able to do to help us understand what's happening in the world around us. So a huge thank you for your time today and for sharing all your knowledge and insights. Where can people find you if they want to connect uh, later or learn more about your work? Um, so I'm on Twitter. My handle is Epi Ellie. 
I also have a podcast about analyzing data that's called Casual Inference, and you can find that on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, um, pretty much any podcast app. Um, and so if you're interested in sort of learning more about how to do good data analysis, um, it's, that's worth checking out as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Ellie. It was great to talk, and we'll look forward to staying in touch in the future. Thank you.